Hello, good morning, South By. I'm Cesar Pereira, uh, head of Embraer uh, Commercial Aviation Sustainability Efforts. And we are here today with very interesting sessions. It's an Embraer day, I would say, four sessions. I hope we can attend them all. We're going to discuss sustainability, uh, technologies, EVTOLs, you know, everything related to aviation. Very interesting topics, and I hope to see all uh, of you again in other sessions. Welcome to this uh, pivotal discussion where aviation uh, meets or intends to meet the environmental sustainability. Today we are here to dive into the complex challenge of making aviation green. For many, aviation sector has been the villain of climate change, responsible for about 2 to 3% of global CO2 emissions a number that is expect, expected to rise with growing demand for air travel, right? Uh, but it's important to say that even this figure is under debate. For some, uh, with the decarbonization efforts of ordinary industries and the steady growth of aviation at about 5 to 6% per year over the past 20 years, Aviation's contribution to the global emissions could be nearing 10% today. But regardless of the precise figure, one thing is clear. Aviation is now facing the pressure to show or to make significant strides toward achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Okay? But before we dive in into this discussion, I'd like to share with you a brief story about my uh, start the start of my career as a civil engineer, that's how I started my career, by the way, in heavy structures, breeds, buildings. Uh, when, after transitioning to aviation, during my first day at work, I was struck by banners all over the company celebrating an employee who had won the first prize around $5,000 and an internal uh, awards program called Good Idea for uh, bringing an innovation Right? Those, 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 those uh, uh, awards is for recognizing employees who give good ideas for cost reduction, you know, process improvements. His idea was a design optimization that shaved off 20 pounds of the aircraft weight. I was shocked to, to learn that, you know, 20 pounds only worth $5,000 in price. That's amazing, right? In civil engineering, you don't pay attention to 20 pounds. Or probably the dust accumulated on top of a bridge who weighs more than 20 pounds, right? But soon I learned that in aviation, that 20 pounds can represent 10,000 less CO2 emissions per aircraft each year. It has been 20 years since that day. Embraer has delivered more than 1,800 aircraft. And we estimate that that 20 pounds already helped to save more than 100 million pounds of CO2. So then, suddenly, that $5,000 seemed quite modest, right? But that's the discussion we are having today. In aviation, every pound matters. Every small step is significant. And every innovative idea, even the small ones, deserves attention and investment. Aviation, the aviation industry is on the brink of a transformation with investments flowing to startups, innovations that aim to change the way we fly. From electric aircraft, renewable fuels, to innovative designs like blended wing bodies, the quest for zero emissions has never been more alive. Today, we are joined by these three distinguished industry leaders at the forefront of this transformation, uh, each sharing a unique perspective from the worlds of investments, technology, and operation. Please, let's welcome our panelists, Ashley Carlson, Senior Vice uh, President at Greentown Labs, Kirsten Bartoktu, co-founder and managing partner at New Vista Capital. <laughs> and Andrea Zax, a seasoned aviation leader, former CEO of Vidro Zero.
I will ask them to introduce themselves in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, but just like to share with you that we have some special giveaways, okay, for those posting, taking a photo of this event or the lounge and tagging Embraer, at Embraer, and a hashtag Embraer at S South by Southwest. Now show to our crew there and you get a special uh, giveaway for today's, okay? So welcome, thank you for attending our, our panel. I hope we have you know, interesting discussion for, for our audience to understand how can we achieve zero emissions or net zero emissions by 2050, right? Just to warm up, I'm gonna ask our panelists here to introduce themselves and ask or actually answer uh, one warm-up question, which is, please give me one word, one word. Uh, your vision for the future of aviation and why you chose that word. Okay, would like to start? Oh, ladies first, Ken? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Ashling Carlson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Partnerships, as was mentioned, at Greentown Labs. And for those that don't know, Greentown Labs is the largest climate tech incubator in North America. So we have two locations, one in Boston, which is our original site, and then our second location in Houston that opened in 2021. And we currently incubate about 250 climate tech startups, stretching the gamut of uh, agriculture, building, manufacturing, electricity, and of course, transportation. We're a nonprofit, so we don't take any equity in the startups that we incubate. They come to us and they apply and they go through some pretty, pretty stringent due diligence to get into Greentown. But we're very proud we have a 90% success rate from our, our survival rate from our startups. So, yeah, doing pretty well. Um, my word, I would say my one word for my vision, I think maybe it's my one word for my, my, my hope for the future of aviation, which is diversity. Uh, I would like to see diversity of players. So more new entrants, new technologies, new ideas coming into the space. I would also like to see diversity of representation. I, I understand that about 88% of pilots, engineers are currently white males. I'd love to see more women. I'd love to see more people of color in the space. Great, excellent. Now, let me just uh, pause for a minute, given that you started, Ashling, uh, spoiler alert now. So in about one hour, we're gonna make an announcement that you know, Embraer X has signed an agreement with uh, Greentown Labs to accelerate the future of sustainable aviation. So we are really happy to collaborate with the Greentown Labs. Uh, and we are too, delighted. Kirsten? Great, thank you for having me here. Um, excited to participate in your day. Um, my name is Kirsten Bartok Tao. I am a co founder and managing partner of New Vista Capital. We are an investment platform that focuses on aerospace, space, and defense tech. Uh, when you talk about aerospace, pretty much most of the innovation is around uh, climate and how we. Uh, transition away from fossil fuels and encourage other technologies. So almost everything we do in that sector focuses on this area of um, what is occurring. I am, I'll kind of go into, my word is transformational because I probably come in a little more of a uh, extremist and rapid view uh, in terms of that I actually believe, and we talked about this earlier, that the, the wing and tube model is done. In the next 50 years, we are going to see um, multiple different types of structures and that the innovations that'll come with structures will lead to our capability of weaning off fossil fuels. But as long as that we are in the wing and tube, which will continue for the next 20, 20 plus years, don't get me wrong, um, but that it's the eventual and we're going to see those structures come out and give us the access that we need to hydrogen, to electric, to other forms of propulsion and it'll provide us a, um, with the innovations to get to net zero in our sector. So I'm excited. I do always say it's a long-term vision, and it's, we'll talk about that path today. Fantastic. Andreas? Thank you. Um, my name is Andreas. Um, I've been working in this industry now for 12 years. Um, 
as a consultant, um, AT Aridan Airline. I've been doing a lot of work with Embraer. Um, we were launch operator in the airline I worked for for the Embraer E2. Uh, a lot of good fun doing EIS that aircraft. Last couple of years, spent most of my time on new technology, new aircraft technology from zero emission aircraft to advanced air mobility. Um, my focus has been, and, and the team I've led has been very much on understanding the business viability. Uh, I think, and it's great that there is so much interest in, in developing new technology, but also we, as businesses wanting to operate them, need to be willing to rethink the way we do things to make them work. So um, my word is clean, not only for clean in terms of sustainability, but also for clean sheet thinking, because I believe as operators, we have a lot to do to rethink our business model and rethink the way we do things to make these new aircraft when they arrive work in the most sustainable and financially way. Beautiful. Yeah, if I can say, I think my, if I can give my word for, for the future of aviation, my word would be boldness, because we need to, to be courageous and make bold decisions for the future of aviation, right? So Andreas, let me start with you then, because we can discuss all day long about technologies, innovations, but it all comes down to implementation, <laughs> right? What, are, what, what do you see as the most significant challenges and opportunities in adopting zero emission uh, technologies um, in regional and even large scale operations? Well, I mean, there are many challenges. Uh, one of them is obviously the ecosystem change needed to make it happen. Uh, huge difference then between different technology mentioned already, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's electricity or a combination, uh, or whether it's SAF. Um, that being said, I think it's also important that we recognize the importance of starting uh, in, in a smaller segment. Uh, you have this debate now in Europe where um, France and now perhaps Spain want to ban regional flights uh, for reducing emissions. I mean, if you isolate that, it might make sense, but the challenge is that I believe the change in technology will come first in a smaller segment. We will see small aircraft, regional aircraft first with zero emission technologies. So if you ban those flights, you'll effectively stop the development of these new aircraft. So um, I'd say, well, there are many challenges, but um, we need to start in, in those segments where it's vi viable first, and I believe that's gonna be regional. Then later we'll see uh, single island, wide body aircraft fly with new technology, but it will come first to regional. Now, how do you believe those challenges can be addressed? The challenges yeah. of ecosystem change. Um, I mean, we, I'm Norwegian, uh, and I think if you look back three, four years, uh, Scandinavia in general were more crazy about the environment than the rest of Europe. Now it's kind of spreading out. It's the same. We're not any better or any more in the forefront. It's the same everywhere. If you go to UK, Germany, France, Spain, it's all the same. Um, for an ecosystem to, to start working in a good way uh, and, and to allow for entry into service, as we call it in aviation, of new, new products, you need to have all stakeholders with you, meaning the airports, um, the CAA, uh, Civil Aviation Authority, um, allowing you to operate. All these stakeholders need to be on the same path. Uh, we've been quite fortunate in Norway because we've been talking about this for a long time, uh, where we have them all on board and we're doing a lot of collaboration with them so that we can prepare everything in, at the same time, airport, airspace, and so on. This is essential. Um, if you look at Europe as a whole, I think we have this challenge that, uh, well, even though we have EASA, which is similar to the FAA here in the US, Federal Aviation Authority, uh, there is a challenge that there are still many different countries with different perspectives on things. Mm -hmm. um, we need to collaborate, and uh, we're therefore engaging a lot of initiatives out of Brussels on, on on uh, how to prepare the whole pan-European ecosystem for this at the same time. Still, I believe it's important to, to be uh, considerate and, and look for a sizable market in one region, perhaps in one country to start with, where you can have all the ecosystem players on board more quickly. Because if this, um, if, if, you, if you look at a too big um, area uh, from the day one, it will take too much time. You should start small and then grow it eventually, I believe. Yeah. May, I, may I support? Please. I, you know, I, I agree completely with your comment that we have to start on the smaller size of the aircraft. And it'll likely, as we're seeing on the electric side, start in the trainer section, so the small airports. Um, and then hydrogen will kind of be more in the regional 
larger cab because that's where it's more appropriate to start and helps on the, the longer range aircraft because of the density. Um, I also sit on the board of uh, an FBO. So an FBO is a, um, an airport for business jets. And it's been interesting to watch them track. They brought me on solely for the sustainability and climate side to watch them now kind of go in the past few years, start to install electric chargers mm -hmm. and the capabilities on their airports to decarbonize, to make that transition and start to plan for hydrogen when it's available and accessible. So I, I do think your point is 100% correct that the, the Petri dish, the place where the experimenters, experimentation is going to happen, is going to be on the smaller end of the aircraft. And then as that technology gets more dense, more capable, it'll grow up to the larger municipal airports that serve the commercial airlines. So I, I completely agree. Absolutely. Now that you move a little bit to technology already, you know, talking about hydrogen, those exciting new technologies. Uh, traditionally, efforts to reduce CO2 emissions are focused on the propulsion system, right, or sustainable renewable fuels. But, you know, there are other innovative technologies or designs that could bring equal or even greater benefits, right? So, Kirsten, uh, are there any of such innovations catching your eye? We had a little pre-talk about this because I forced it in. Um, it, we spend a lot of time on SAF, which I admit I'm excited about, but I, that's not our panacea. It's not going to solve our problems. You know, there's an argument of whether it's going to be 20% or more of reducing emissions in aerospace. That isn't going to get us to where we need to be. So it's really the capabilities and how we um, innovate around these, these new sources of propulsion. Um, and to your point, you know, we're seeing some exciting um, changes going on in the blended wing. Airbus had originally come at it. We have Jet Zero, and basically it changes the aircraft so it's, it flows easier through the aircraft. It also, um, through the sky, with less resistance. Um, it holds fuel in a different way, which is why it's very apropos for hydrogen in the long term. Um, we're seeing other things like the slotted natural laminar wing, which is said to reduce lift, uh, which reduce um, improve efficiency up to 50%, and then the trust base wing that we're seeing from, from Boeing being pushed. So I'm actually a fan that it's these type of innovations, and it goes back to my earlier comment, that we are going to see the, the true efficiency gains that we need and also the capability of incorporating those new technologies. Because if you move certainly to hydrogen, the, the wing and tube aircraft is not the most efficient structure to have. Um, and then we'll see the same. So if you can combine both the structural, uh, the structural advantage of being having an aircraft that will slip through the air with less resistance, and then you combine that with the novel sources of fuels, we will be able to get to the efficiency commitments that we've made. That's the challenge aviation faces since ever, right? Define the gravity and the air resistance. Right? <laughs> no, but it's amazing. Those new technologies are really encouraging, and I hope we can they can can be a reality soon, right? And Ashley, you're also in the world of startups, exciting technology. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you see are the more, most promising technologies out there, and what are the barriers for 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 bringing them into reality, uh, or even to to scaling those new technologies? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and you're right. I I live and breathe the, the startup world at Greentown Labs, and I hear you that you know there's these really exciting more cutting edge technologies that are coming to market. But you know, when I think about some of the when I think about some of the barriers and, and it's actually funny, it's like the kind of circularity or the catch twenty two that I see specifically with SAF around, you know, if it's commercially viable, it's not abundant. If it's abundant, then it's not cost effective. If it's affordable, then it's maybe not as sustainable. Um, and so these kind of catch-22s around SAF specifically. But there are still some really cool technologies out there that are coming out of incubators like Greentown. So a startup that comes to mind is a, one of our Houston founding members, actually, uh, called Semvita. I don't know, has anyone heard of Semvita before? Is that a name that anyone recognizes? No, okay, well, uh, hopefully you're gonna hear about them soon. So Semvita is a, well, they, they have a production process whereby they use um, engineered microbes to uh, convert CO2 into 
chemicals, which can then be used as a, a feedstock for, for a SAF. And they have uh, very recently signed an agreement with United uh, who are going to purchase a billion gallons of oh. SAF over the next 20 years from them. So, you know, you're seeing some, some actual kind of real deals going through. You're seeing the incumbents partnering with the startups, which is in my role as senior vice president of partnerships is what I'm all about. You know, how can we help our startup members to accelerate and get their product into market? so that we can fight climate change. And we have a, you know, to, to answer the second part of your question, on how, you know, like how, are we, how are we actually going about doing that? So we have a number of different programs, but the one that I think is, is really our flagship is called Greentown Go. It's an accelerator program that works with corporate partners that have an opportunity space or a specific challenge that they're facing that they, they want to, partner with startups to try and solve for and take advantage of. And so this program is designed around that problem space that a corporate partner has. And we work then to scout startups from across the globe that help solve that problem. And we bring them in and then we down select probably from about 150 applicants to about six startups that participate in the program with the corporate partner and end up with a final cohort of startups that we then work hand in glove with, with that corporate partner to, to actually create partnership outcomes. And whether that's JDAs, licensing agreements, direct investment opportunities, because that's how these startups are gonna get their product into market faster. It's not you know, doing it alone, no. no. Going, going in partnership with the big corporates that have the infrastructure, then we're gonna start to see real change happen fast. Partnerships and collaboration, right? 100%. But when it comes to startups or new technology, let's say, two things come to my mind, right? One is the technology itself, new technology that can help to decarbonize the skies. But there's a second one, which is cost, because it also needs to make you know, economic sense. You mentioned one of them, Sandita, for example, right? Uh, are any of these technologies also aiming to reduce the cost of its applicability? You know, because in the end, everything comes down to a financial uh, viability. Our, I mean, yes, ultimately, um, I think those startups, they have a number of challenges that they face when they're coming into markets. Um, and getting funding themselves is often one of the biggest right. challenges. Right. So I would say that you know, reducing the cost is, is going to be top of mind but aspirationally, I would say, because first of all, they need to prove out the technology, they need to see, get the funding, they need to find the corporate partner to roll it out with. And hopefully through that process can also reduce the cost. But I, w it wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's the first thing that startups talk to me about when we're, when we're uh, figuring out partnership deals for them, but I would say it's definitely something that's on their mind if they want to scale. Oh, great. It's two in this financial aspects and then our end user, I would say airlines, they are also concerned about the financial viability of those new technologies, right? Andreas, how do you believe airlines they can balance this need uh, for environmental sustainability with the economic viability of this operation? Because not only the new technology can be more expensive, but even new technology overall, right? Could be the aircraft, could be structures, could be new designs, could be uh, renewable fuels. Today we know they are all more expensive in a way, right? Uh, and how do you believe the airlines can balance this, this economic viability? It's a good question. And talking about partnerships, uh, we, we did a quite extensive collaboration with a company called Embraer um, here today and, and Rolls-Royce on this. And we, this is public. We, we've, but what we tried to do was to really understand the financial and economic viability of a regional size hydrogen electric aircraft. Um, what this research showed is that the big challenge we have is that the cost of investing in them and the infrastructure around is the big challenge. Long term, throughout the lifetime of the aircraft, it is, of course, under a lot of assumptions based on carbon taxation and the price of energy, price of renewable energy, these assumptions made. Uh, but there is, it looks like that through the lifetime of an aircraft, the cost of operating that aircraft, the cost of ownership, as we say, may be equal or lower than a conventional aircraft. But it's based on assumptions, and it's very sensitive to these assumptions on what's the cost of carbon um, emissions in the future 
five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when you buy an aircraft, you have it for 20, 25 years, right? That's, that's a long time. Uh, it's also a big question about uh, energy. Uh, what's the cost of renewable energy? Uh, in Europe at the moment, we have a challenge with not too much energy, uh, and, and uh, it's a big debate on what that energy should be used for. So with that in mind, it's, I mean, it makes sense to think that, okay, energy will cost a lot in the future, or at least more than it does today in the future, and especially renewable energy. Energy efficiency will be key. Um, and this is why we spent a lot of time in understanding different concepts. You mentioned it already, how can you create the most energy efficient aircraft? That has to do with the propulsion system, but also, of course, the aircraft design. Um, and talking about SAF, I mean, it's already mentioned here. Uh, if you look at hydrogen versus SAF, I believe that's where hydrogen uh, has a benefit because if you're producing SAF from a biosource, making biofuel, it's one thing. If you produce SAF from uh, hydrogen or electricity, so-called ESAF, um, if you look through the chain of that from where it's being produced till it's been become propulsion, in an Embraer aircraft perhaps, it's a lot of energy being lost on its way. And my question is then, how much energy will we be allowed to waste on producing the perfect fuel? Um, this is key. So uh, I'd say when, when we look at it, we need to, we, we cannot look at it only here today. We need to look into the future and understand energy prices, uh, carbon taxation, and how this all adds up. And based on the assumption we made in this study with Embraer and Rolls-Royce, we were envisioning a, an aircraft lasting 25 years to be equally economical as a, a conventional aircraft. Uh, but it's very dependent on assumptions, of course, uh, related to carbon taxation and, and energy costs. Excellent. Well, let me bring you to this discussion, Kirsten, because uh, investment is key to make all this uh, a reality in the future. Uh, when we talk about investment, we also think about the private sector, right? OEMs, airlines, when they buy aircraft, OEMs, when they develop technology, startups, right, fundings. But there is also, the government needs to play a role in this as well, right? So how critical is the government involvement in all this development, uh, through being policies or public uh, private partnerships, incentives, how do you believe is the government role on this debate? Uh, it's a great question. And on a good note, we are seeing a significant amount of government support. Now, it varies by country and by nation, and each country is doing it differently. And, and as a result of their internal initiatives, you see pockets of support. So in Europe and France and in the UK, we see a lot of hydrogen support and hydrogen efforts in that markets. In the US, we're seeing some from the Inflation Reduction Act and a lot of support coming out of DOE and XM on the transition side, both a recognition early on, it was from the DOE side, how do we create these end products that are more sustainable? But now, now there's also a look in the US that we have a, a point of saying, we wanna build more manufacturing in the US. So how do you transition what you're doing? The tough part we have in our sector is that to date, both the capital invested on the energy side or on the structure side hasn't produced venture-like returns. And there needs to be some sort of support coming from the government if they want new models, new initiatives, early stage startups to focus on these deep tech areas. Mm -hmm. Because that is partly why you're seeing institutional money and family offices, foundations, endowments go into other areas that reap tech-like returns. And deep tech is very difficult to achieve tech-like returns. So there needs to be some sort of, there are one or two programs we're seeing certainly in the US where the government is trying to give leverage to funds that focus on these critical technology areas. But we need more governments to start looking at it that way. Create the startups who come up with the new ideas, and then companies like Embraer that have been incredibly forward-leaning. I actually encourage you all to look at the, the conversation that Embraer has been focused on the last four years, leading up this, talking about it more than most of their competitors or compatriots. Um, but there needs to be more support for that because they can't do it alone. They have traditional initiatives 
And, and this is where the partnership both with the early stage capital and later stage, but the governments need to come in and not just, I'm gonna use a word for the group, we talk about TRLs. It goes TRL zero through nine. The government tends to come in both at the early stage in these small multi-million dollar grants that are SIBRs, and then they come in at the later stage, kind of TRL six when you're ready to build manufacturing. We need more of them at TRL two, three, four, five to put significant amount of capital to develop these structures because in aerospace, which is different than space, and it's different than drones, these programs are very expensive because they have to be certified. And we now are looking, and, and interesting enough, and this is kind of going in a different tangent, and I apologize, mm -hmm. but the US specifically is becoming less competitive because of some certification issues we've had, and we see a lot more innovation going to other countries because those, let's say, certification governments are better equipped to work with new technologies. So there's so many, we're seeing more money, we need to see more. We need to see them really recognize that uh, this is going to be a, a growing problem as other industries are able to decarbonize and aerospace goes from 3% to 4% to 8% to 9% because we're not making the rapid advancements that other industries are relative to us. Can I Please. jump in? I, I, um, I wanted to share an example uh, from Greentown, again, where we're seeing the role of government funding making a real difference. Uh, so we run a program called Carbon to Value, uh, and it's a, it's a program, accelerator program, focused on the carbon tech space. And our, in our fourth year of, of running this program, we've had three cohorts in 2021, 22, and 23. And the program launched when carbon tech was really still in its infancy infancy. But it launched because we were able to secure catalytic funding from NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, who put up half the, the capital needed to launch the program under the agreement that we would then source the second half of the capital from private funders. Now, that program has been a roaring success. We've had three cohorts come out of it. Uh, eat all of the startups focus on carbon tech in some way, everything from direct air capture, point of source, biomass, biochar, you know, enabling technologies. Um, but it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have had the foresight of that, of that government body saying, yes, we wanna be involved in this. We're going to put the money down we see the public-private partnership angle and the need to create an ecosystem and to have government, uh, carbon tech experts, corporates, and then at the heart of the program, the startups that participate, all coming together. And can I give one more because sure. you brought, you know, we have um, in the US, I'll give you an example of uh, Beta Technologies, which is an electric aircraft company that is growing in, in, in the venture world. Um, it early stage was backed with what, small business innovation awards that they were given, and then was given a matching grant and more additional money from the Department of Defense because they cared about this sector. And then recently they received a $175 million loan to build their manufacturing facility in uh, Vermont. So these are the type of things that when you see a viable team, a viable company out there building interesting things, that the government is looking to give capital. We have a few loans that are in line with the Department of Energy right now as well, which could also be transformational. So there is that support, but it's typically when you're building the manufacturing for that capability, and we kind of need it in the, the mid to growth, the Series A and B sections of right now. Andrea, is Electriago's perspective in Europe? Oh yeah. Um, and. Uh, talking about funding and support, I, uh, I mean, you, you're talking about the early TRLs, like mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, when we're getting closer to a, a product which can be used, but it's maybe not the perfect product yet. It's kind of a prototype thing, something you just want to fly, perhaps from Beta or, or Embraer or any other of the manufacturer mentioned. Um, there is a, a scheme we have in Norway, and I think it's it quite common in Europe, where you also can have support on the demand side. To, to purchase products which are not really perfectly commercially viable without any support. But this mechanism is all about where they can pay up to 50% of the investment cost of a new product if it is a, a um, very sustainable product or it's reducing emissions substantially. And I think that is a perfect uh, mechanism or, or support scheme for the later TRLs where you want kind of the customer to be in position 
to, to buy the products a bit sooner than you would uh, if the scheme w was not there. Because that's a challenge I see, is that when you are a, an operator, you want to kind of wait with your investment until you know that this product is, is fully mature, uh, because the risk is so high, and so on. So these schemes, I believe, is, is beneficial. Another thing, uh, or another uh, support scheme which has been highly successful in Scandinavia is um, the, uh, through the taxation system, we've managed to, to uh, create um, the, um, uh, the introduction of EVs very efficient. Um, it's in Norway now, more than 80% of all new cars sold are EVs. Mm -hmm. I think we have, uh, I mean, in terms of number of cars, the higher, highest penetration of Teslas in the world at the moment. Uh, for two reasons, the ecosystem was prepared with chargers everywhere, so it's easy to open Tesla and everybody have a wall charger at home. Secondly, they uh, gave us tax reduction if you buy a Tesla versus buying a petrol car. So this is kind of this uh, indirect stimulus where you can also create a, a pull from the demand side, which I believe in, in the later TRL is important because we as a customer need to be confident that we can make the investment in early stage or or, or, I mean, if not a prototype, but, a, but the first version of a new car or a new plane, uh, a little less risky to de-risk that investment. That's important. So that's also a, a kind of support I believe is uh, very uh, beneficial and a good support scheme when products mature and when they're close to, to commercialization to make the first customers kind of bite on and say, yes, we want to try it out. Uh, so that's something, I'm not sure if that's common here in the U.S., but in Europe you have those schemes where you get You almost support. wish everyone to get together and share best practices, right? Wish Figure it, out wish what's it. working, yeah. 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 I, I want to touch Please. on an, just a, a funny story which I actually mentioned to you uh, when we were preparing, that um, there's a, a company that came out of the first cohort of the Carbon to Value program uh, that I was just mentioning. It's called Air Company. And to your point around, you know, proving out the technology before, you know, commercializing and getting up that TRL scale, um, this company came to the Carbon to Value program uh, and the technology is really neat. So the technology is a, um, a thermochemical catalytic converter that uses CO2 and hydrogen um, to produce ethanol. And their first product to market was actually a really high-end vodka. And they were, yeah, and they were going around Miami selling their vodka to different nightclubs, building revenue, really importantly, building a brand also. But the longer-term vision, which we helped tease out through the Carbon to Value to program, was how could they actually start to use that same technology to produce SAF, which is now what they're doing. So they actually signed an agreement with the DOD, $65 million uh, agreement. I think it was, I don't know, maybe like three months ago now, um, which actually goes full circle to when we were talking about the role that government plays, you know, seeing how they came through this program that was government funded and then maybe I'll have a government partner. But I just love that story, how they went Absolutely. from being vodka retailers to <laughs> producers of SAF, but it helped them build build the product, help yeah. them test, help them get to where they are. Can we conclude that vodka is a sustainable? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really important for climate change. You know, we all need some Absolutely. vodka. <laughs> we all agree with that then. Uh, well, obviously the government support is important. I think that's the conclusion here. The government needs to step in, right, to contribute, to support. But given one, one thing is collaboration, learn from each other's experience. But do you believe, and the question goes to any of you, please, who wants to answer, that could create, this could create an imbalance in the competitive landscape if you come up with different incentives, different subsidies in Europe, in the US, for example, or in the end, everything comes together in the future? I think certainly from, <laughs> you see it, I mean, not as much because I think you will see a location and government shopping for where you establish factories, where you get your aircraft certified, um, how you do entry into market, without a doubt. And it, it's an unusual for people who've, like us who've been in the industry a long time to think about that. 
but without a doubt, that does seem to where our world is trending. Um, it also, you know, it's interesting, we all grew up in a world of where the global supply chain was global, completely global. And now, to some extent, we're working in a more siloed supply chain, which is disconcerting and odd for all of us as we make that adjustment, but probably will accelerate as well. So it is a, um, it, it will have impacts, but also, like I said, both the government funding, but the capabilities of our certification organizations as well. Um, that has reshuffled significantly over the last few years. Hmm. Another challenge uh, I see is that, I mean, for, for you and Embraer or any other OEM to produce a, a, a new aircraft and see it all the way through certification already mentioned, I mean, you need to scale this, you need to produce quite a few aircraft. It's not for us to buy five or ten, you need to produce 500 or a thousand of them to make that kind of whole investment worth it. Um, talking about regulations and the different uh, markets around the world, I think it's, it's, although it's good that some countries are moving ahead and want to be in the forefront, it's still important that we try to have as much harmonization as possible to create market big enough for the OEMs to produce any aircraft. So even though you could foresee a, a, some sort of a competition between the certification authorities and so on, if you produce an aircraft, you want it to be certified with EASA, with FAA, Absolutely. with ANAC, and, and so on. And uh, we should try to encourage them to, to collaborate as much as possible so that we, we cr create big enough markets for you as manufacturers. One thing we haven't talked about today, and I'm kind of bringing it a different, but additive manufacturing is getting a lot of push um, and I think support. You talked about the cost of building an aircraft. Uh, the unit size goes into it. I mean, as we shift towards a more composite build aircraft away from aluminum, we're seeing a lot of advancements in um, CMCs, high temp materials, composites. So I, I will say the level of innovation going on at the, the chemistry level, which will add to, and then both with the machining to build those pieces um, and a recognition that our supply chain is fragile, so you need other ways to do it. I, I am, I always say I'm, Long-term, very, very optimistic, and short-term, I just want to be slightly pessimistic because sometimes you don't see those in the time of a venture fund, which makes it difficult, but I really do think that the, the, we can almost see the number of companies you see incubating at the bottom will have an impact later because there are so many going after these areas, so both, both the machining, the additive manufacturing, and then the different type of composite uh, chemistries which will lead to both high temps and, and different capabilities on that. So, Again, short term, I, I think it's going to be tough in the next five years because an aircraft program takes so long to build, but long term, um, I'm hopeful. And I will go back to one point. It is tough. We see most of the innovation on the early side, so the trainer type aircraft. It is very difficult to make a business model out of building a trainer aircraft. You're just not going to make that many of them, and they don't cost that much. So you really make money when you enter the regional market and the, the large, um, the mid-sized cabin market, the single aisle. It's those areas, the commercial market, where you can sell many units where the money is, but we have to figure out a way to get there. <laughs> Absolutely. And as a former structures engineer, I'm really excited about this new technologies composite, right? But one thing I've learned, uh, they are expensive, right? <laughs> we right need now. to work to bring the costs down. And talking about that, uh, I once want to leave some questions to, uh, for the audience, right? So we have uh, about a minute here, but that to me is a fundamental question. It's clear that, you know, to be more sustainable, at least in a near future, uh, is going to be more expensive, right? We need to invest in technology. Sustainable fuels are more expensive. These new technology structures, or hydrogen, or so, and someone needs to bear the cost initially, at least, right? Could be the airlines through decreased profits. Could be governments through incentives or subsidies, or the passengers through higher ticket price. You know, who do you believe should bear the costs initially? Don't be on the fence, okay? <laughs> Why am I saying that? Okay, just to give you an example, right? In Europe, they have the, the, the stick, right? So that's the mandate, work on it. US, they have the carrot, right? With the IRA, for example, just to talk about SAF. Singapore said, no, it's the passenger, that's it, you pay for it. Which one's correct? It's a good question. Um, generally, I believe we 
don't know enough about what the customers really want. Uh, we, when, when we talk in panels like this, we very often talk to, to um, other people in our industry or kind of in an echo chamber. We're, we're, we're all thinking in the same sphere uh, and, and we, we don't really know, I believe, enough about what the real willingness to pay for this is out there. That's something we should spend more time on understanding. Um, the company I work for, we, we launched what, something we called uh, Air Mobility Labs, where we really wanted to go out and talk with customers to understand not only uh, their willingness to pay, but also we were talking about advanced air mobility and introduction of new uh, mobility concepts to try to really ask the end customers, is this something you, you, you really want? Is this something you're after? Not just assuming that they want that service or assuming that they're willing to pay, let's say, 20% more for a more sustainable travel. So I, I think there is still a lot of research to be done in that domain to understand uh, the willingness to pay more. Um, that being said, I mean, ultimately either the customer or the taxpayer has to pay, right? The airlines can only give so much. It's not, at least in Europe, too much margin on airlines at the moment. So it's either through taxation or, or, or political incentives or through higher prices on the airfares. So the taxpayer or the customer will have to pay. Great. Whatever has to be done has to be a level playing field. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a good point. And I think that's key. So if you put it on, and I, I, I see it difficult to get agreement globally or on the airlines to put, a, to put an additional fee on as much as I would like that. So I do think it's probably gonna fall to the taxpayer. Um, and part of that is okay because that, so when you're able to build up a competitive advantage in a technology, there are ways to leverage that later within your country for your, for, your capabilities in the future. We watch that solar now is completely controlled by China. We can't catch up. Battery technology, we're trying hard. So if you're able to build up, we are amazing in engines in both Europe and, and the Americas. So if you build up that capability, which is why it might be something more that the taxpayer should encourage, then you get to keep that domestic capability as well and leverage that for other areas, other industries. Great, yeah, thank points. you. I think um, to your question around you know who should pay for it, I I think again I agree I think it's going to be the taxpayer and I I, I have concerns um, around access if it was to be the customer honestly you know who is going to have the luxury of travel if it is ultimately the customer that has to pay for this um, and does it just end up being something that only the sort of top percent of people can actually have access to and is that equitable um, so so yeah I, I, I look to the government to to try and stimulate a market in the same way you know as you mentioned Ira we see Microsoft taking advantage of this and purchasing SAF selling it to airlines creating that you know creating that basically creating the beginning of a market to create more supply so that we can then have it be more affordable and that's what i think that's what we want great thank you i want to take questions from the audience now uh but this session is being broadcasted if you could go to the microphone over there so everyone watching could uh, hear your question please yeah thank you hi i'm sarah mitran i'm a commercialization consultant i live in austin um and uh, actually became a mentor and consultant in clean tech when Greentown uh, Labs first opened in Boston. Um, I actually conducted a, a market assessment for um, a drone company, and what I discerned was that a line of sight was a huge impediment, which was obviously for drone operators, you have to be looking at it and not lose sight of it and if you, you know, if it gets lost, then you're in trouble. Um, so for non-US people, it's a huge impact. Now, I've, I've, I've recently learned that um, the FAA has loosened those regulations a little bit, and MANA drone and wing are beta testing in Dallas or Fort Worth or one of those things. Um, so obviously that is some opening of the market, perhaps. 
but at the same time, still safety is an issue. So uh, uh, in Austin, we have lift aircraft, which is an EV toll. Um, and in my opinion, they are TRL nine. They've been testing that for a long time. I mean, Anderson Cooper flew on it. So that's got to be safe. So, but still, um, you know, in the last two months, we have Boeing's uh, Alaska Airlines exit door open in the mid middle of a middle flight, and then we have a United Air flight that drops the, the tire and falls off. So, I mean, still, like, are we, <laughs> are the airlines just you know, trying to <laughs> block progress? Because I think we want to move green, or at least I want to move green, but are the airlines just kind of uh, giving us a, a black mark and, and trying to um, interfere with progress? Anyone wants to take that one? Uh, I, I, we have had a, um, a few disappointing and unfortunate safety issues that have truly set our already slow, and the FAA used to be the regulatory body that everyone followed in the world. It is now trailing, um, and you know everyone needs to work together and be aligned with rules, but we have an issue of the FAA has difficulty recruiting talented people. They don't have the capabilities to evaluate these technologies, and now they are terrified of making mistakes. So in, in the US, we are in a a difficult cycle um, of our regulatory system. We have a dysfunctional government, which can't seem to pass a budget, which it causes huge problems again in the government support. So, you know, we see if you look actually at the drone sector, which I'm going to go back to kind of national security or national interest, and Europe's been much more functional than we have, but cargo um, delivery drones are, I don't want to say ubiquitous but widely used across China, and their companies are doing so much better. And because they had a company like DJI, they also make the least costly, most efficient drone in the world. So we basically, because our regulatory environment was behind, abdicated leadership in the drone sector. And now the drones you see in Ukraine, almost all come, the motors, the capabilities, all come from China because they're able to use additive manufacturing and they've done it better. So that is exactly what happens when we have a dysfunctional government, when we have industry that made some difficult, painful mistakes um, and haven't corrected them as quickly as they should. So I think you probably are aligned here, we're all worried. Um, because airlines can't work, aerospace can't work, unless we have a healthy regulator to partner with and, um, and work Perfect. with. Perfect. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, um, I'm Paulo. I'm originally from Brazil, so I'm glad to see that Emirates remains an, an outlier and a leader in the regional market um, for jets. But, you know, we're talking about jurisdictional shopping. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you have seen in terms of what you think looks more attractive right now? Because um, you mentioned that you know there, there are things going on in Europe, there's things going on in the US. How about China? How about Brazil? Because, for example, we know in Brazil that Embraer has been very successful despite the Brazilian government. So it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about that. Well, I think our moderator, maybe the question yeah. for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the moderator here. Well, jurisdictional shopping, I, I would say the we are here uh, initially talking about technology, right, development. So funding, uh, subsidies through, uh, but the, the, the aviation sector is, is really regulated in terms of, uh, we need to be careful on, on incentives, on subsidies, because you know, there are many cases in the WTO already between the biggest OEMs, you know, that has been uh, the, the regulators and the governments they have been watching the competitive landscape because we don't have a lot of OEMs out there and it must be that this global market is, is regulated, right? But incentives can, con can come in many different uh, aspects, in many different ways, I would say. Could be uh, through R&D research, and in Brazil, for example, there are lines of credits for R&D, right? So low TRLs, the same in Europe. Embraer yeah, actually is, is, uh, is participating in some initiatives like the clean aviation in Europe, the Dutch growth in the Netherlands. So there are 
incentives, government incentives for uh, technology development, and I believe that's where the governments play an important role, right? Because that technology could be applied in many different areas, many different industries, and that's the role of the government. But when it comes to the product, when it comes to commercialization, that is a different story. That is more an open market, then there's a competitive landscape that we need to preserve and need to make sure there is a fair competition to avoid this imbalance in the global market. Yeah, next please. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. Fascinating insights, really, from all of you. Uh, I'm Freddie, a brand strategist from London. Um, I was part of the team in 2019, so five years ago, that helped set up a partnership between the UK government, Oxford Catalyst, which is a sort of bio lab in, in Oxford, British Airways, and Shell. Um, and at the time, BA made a commitment to 25% of all their fuel being provided by Oxford Catalysts eventually. Um, the plant is in construction, it hasn't made any fuel yet, but it's planned to be fully operationalized by 2028. It's a waste of jet fuel project. Um, we cut to December of last year, and um, at the end of 2023, Shell pulled out of the project, focusing their resources on lower carbon fuel opportunities. From my perspective, they rode the curtails of five years of positive press around the project, it was all over their socials. They did exactly what you might expect Shell to have done um, and really sort of greenwashed and then bailed, reprioritized. How can we maintain help big airlines, fuel codes, engineering companies, airports, governments, even if SAF alone is not the solution on its own? How can we make them stick to their commitments, take a longer horizon, 10 to 30 years, because five is its just not enough. I, I would be in agreement. I think we see changes, and you look, anytime you get a change in leadership at a new company, the strategy adjusts, and you have commitments that were made earlier. And, and the tough part about all of these, whether it's an aircraft program or a, a SAF manufacturing, it is a long-term commitment. So, um, does any of my panelists have suggestions for it? Because, I mean, it is a problem we all recognize. Um, I think we need to see shareholders exert more pressure uh, on, on the companies. Um, I think they, they do exert pressure, but it's not always the kind of pressure we want. Um, and so I think, you know, I know we've seen activist shareholders taking stakes in some of Shell's competitors, for example. Um, and that's been in the headlines recently is there's been a bit of a tussle between, you know, these folks that are trying to instigate change within the organization and create those longer term goals, which you mentioned. Um, but it's tough when, as you say, there are sh it's short term cycles and commitments get pulled. Yeah, I, I believe there is an opportunity. Uh, a good thing with aviation is that when you when you buy a product, you buy an aircraft, you, you're stuck with it for quite some time. Um, so it means that those doing the investment appraisals, they have a 20, 25 year perspective normally on what they're doing. Uh, Someone say, okay, you can sell your aircraft after 10 years, but you know the, the cost of introducing a new aircraft type to your organization is huge. So you kind of, when you make that decision, you make it for a long time. The challenge, I believe, is that at the moment, w there is still so much uncertainty around politics, what is the benefit of reducing emissions. We don't really know with certainty what the business case is going to look like. Uh, we don't, I mean, it's a big discussion in Europe at the moment with SAF. How much is that actually reducing emissions? How good is that versus hydrogen? Mm -hmm. uh, before we land that, we cannot make our business cases uh, detailed enough to make an investment. That's the problem. So w when we kind of get that, we will have to make a decision and then we'll call Embraer and say, okay, we want an hydrogen aircraft versus a SAF aircraft. Then you're kind of committing to a long, long time frame. But I think we're right now in a place where politicians are a bit reluctant to, to define the politics for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, the manufacturers are a bit uncertain on what they should bet on because they don't know really the politics going forward. And we as a customers, were, so we're in this, this, this kind of uh, uh, cycle where we, we can't really decide. But I think that's the key. When we can land that case for aviation, 
it will be a long-term project with a new aircraft, which sits for 10, 15, 20 years. We ran out of time, but please, last question, if we can be really quick, and also on the answer, straight to the point, please. Okay. Um, hi, Lucas here, uh, co-founder of the Sustainable Air Lab. I'll be on stage after lunch. Thanks, Freddy, for the great question. I think it leads to mine. Um, the aviation industry has pledged to become a net zero industry by 2050. Coming here to Austin, my first flight was on an aircraft that was delivered 27 years ago, and 2050 is 26 years from today. Personal question to you, do you personally believe we will make this 2050 goal, and why? That's what we are here, right? <laughs> That's why we are here. Really to work towards that. Uh, I can take that question if you don't, please, because it's an aircraft OEM. We make aircraft to fly 40 years, right? For, even for safety reasons, for regulations, right? Uh, we need to comply with a lot of regulations for safety reasons. But you're right. Now it's the pressure for, for climate uh, or for emissions reduction. The fleet renewal is the best answer the airlines can give today mm. to reduce emissions because the aircraft efficiency has improved 20, 25% over the past 15 years, let's say 10, 15 years. You mentioned about the aircraft that's 27 years old, right? So the best answer that's available now is replace old or aging fleet by new technology aircraft, right? To get to 2050 is a stepped approach. There's no one silver bullet that you're gonna wake up in the morning and say, wow, that's the solution for everything, right? You need to go step by step, renewing the fleet, more efficient aircraft, then starting adopting the technologies. I totally agree with you. Let's start talking to airlines, everyone. That video is, is, was, was one example, right? They renewed the fleet with efficient jets, and I believe many airlines, they realize that that's the way to go, okay? So, so, sorry we don't have more time, but I would like to thank our panelists for this great discussion, really important for our industry, and for your participation.